So who's ready to talk about gay space wizards? Do, 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 do. I have no intro music. Listen, I can't leave my house and I am no longer affiliated with Washburn, so... Honestly, at this point, all pretense of professionalism is kind of out the window. So welcome back to Sunflower Sutras with Not Tara, me, Ryan. Today I want to talk about a couple books that I've read recently, Gideon the Ninth and Hare the Ninth. They are part of the Locked Tomb Trilogy by Tamsin Muir. The third book is scheduled for release in 2022. But I've read the first two books now, and I want to talk about them. So I'm actually not positive where to start with these books. They are genre-bending science fantasy books about necromancers, specifically a necromancer named Harrow and her cavalier, which is basically like a glorified bodyguard, Gideon. The first book, Gideon the Ninth, is uh, a gothic mystery thriller. It really just defies categorization. And Hair of the Ninth falls in pretty easily to psychological horror with a little bit of cosmic horror. But despite being a little bit clear in its genre, it is definitely the much more difficult book to actually talk about, but we'll get to that. Something that really stands out about these books is their style. It will shift very suddenly from epic to humorous, from horrifying to cheeky, and it's very jarring at first. Um, I wasn't really sure how I felt about it when I first started reading, but... Two books in, it's definitely grown on me. When she wants to be serious, Muir has this very extensive vocabulary. You can really just tell that she's someone who just loves words. And this really serves her well when she's writing in this more serious kind of high fantasy vibe. And it also certainly comes in handy when she'll name specific bones and muscles, which can be a little hard to follow if you know, you haven't quite been brushing up on your anatomy, but the specificity of it is very visceral and makes it feel a lot more real. And perhaps more importantly, it means that Mir doesn't have to write the word bone a hundred times on the same page. Uh, this is about necromancers, after all, and there are lots of skeletons and lots of bones. And I really enjoy her sense of humor as well. Like I said, it can be very jarring at first. She kind of just slaps you in the face with it but there's there are a lot of genuinely funny moments in both books it's a little hard to describe her sense of humor it, it's kind of memey but not in a cringy way if that makes sense there's also a lot of dad jokes which is pretty great gideon who is our point of view character throughout most of the first book she is of the opinion that all puns are inherently funny and Harrow hates it, and it's wonderful. But <laughs> I suppose that's as good of a transition as any into the characters. The cast is possibly this book's greatest strength. Almost everyone is likable, and even the people who aren't likable are still interesting. Like, they're unlikable because they're well-written to be unlikable. There really isn't anyone that I didn't want to see more of by the end. So in this setting, civilization is divided up into nine houses, and like each house has its own planet, and each of the houses are run by necromancers. And the core premise of the first book is that each of the houses is, except for the first house, is sending like their best necromancer and their cavaliers to a spooky mansion so that they can uncover the secret of how to become lictors, which are uh, the most powerful necromancers. Like, lictors are full-on, like, OP, please nerf necromancers of this universe. Like, they are almost gods. They are incredibly powerful. So, our protagonist, Harrow and Gideon, are from the Ninth House, and the core dynamic between them is just so engaging. It's just filled with so much drama and so much antagonism, but also 
Uh, they're super protective of each other. And they're both just complete disasters. And it's so great to read. Some of the standout secondary characters for me would be... So there's Magnus, who is the Cavalier of the Fifth House. And he's the only person that shares Gideon's sense of humor. And when the two of them are together, it's just a, a complete shit post. It's great. The Third House, their whole dynamic... So. They actually sent two necromancers, twins, and then they're, they have one cavalier. And the dynamic between the three of them is just a constant mystery. Like, you never really know what their deal is. But I think my favorite of the secondary characters has to be Polemides, who is the sixth house necromancer. He is the only person in the spooky mansion who is as smart as Harrow is. And it leads to constant bickering between them. They never stop just trying to flex on each other. But it's, it's so much more than that, because Polemides, despite being the smartest person in the room pretty much anywhere he goes, he has an ego. He definitely has an ego. But there's still this kindness to him. He doesn't let his own self-aggrandizing get in the way of being a decent person. He's also basically a librarian, and that's just pretty rad. So I've talked a little bit about how the style of these books can be a little jarring at times, uh, particularly at first. But I think it's also worth talking about how the books themselves are just very disorienting. In the first book, it mostly comes down to Muir keeps the world building pretty, pretty close to the chest. She doesn't really give a lot of exposition, and so, so there's not really a lot of detail given about how things work. You pretty much have to infer things, and even then it can be pretty easy to miss. So it takes a while to really feel like you have a handle on the world, and it never really stops feeling kind of alien, which is fitting for you know a science fantasy setting. But where things get really weird is in the second book, Harrow the Ninth. So you may have noticed that I haven't really been talking much about the second book, that's because there's not a ton I can say about it that wouldn't get into spoiler territory. It doesn't immediately pick up where the first book ends, and it goes in a completely different direction than I was expecting. There's really no plot details that I could get into that wouldn't pretty much spoil a lot about not only that book, but also the ending of the first one. But there are a few things I can say. This book was a fever dream. It made some very bold decisions, and I can imagine that this was very alienating to a lot of readers. For one, uh, about half of the book is in second person, which is definitely going to be a turnoff to some people, and it really threw me off at first. And I've seen some division, which I expected from readers. I've seen a couple reviews most people tend to agree that the last third or so of the book is fantastic, but there seems to be a lot of division as to whether or not the stuff leading up to it, like the first two-thirds of the book, they're actually good, or if the first two-thirds is just something you have to kind of slog through. I am in the camp that the whole book is good, because as weird and dense and bizarre and challenging as the first part is, it gets across what it's trying to do very well, I think. And it really puts you in the shoes of our protagonist. And just the payoff is so good. The pay <laughs> there is oh man, the last the last third of that book really is amazing. And I don't think it would be as amazing as it was if the set if the first part of it wasn't written the way that it was. And the last thing I want to get into something I really appreciate about these books is how the themes are baked into the fantastic elements in the story. And that's always something I really appreciate in fantasy or speculative fiction in general. But to talk about that stuff, I do have to go a little bit into spoiler territory. So I'm going to go ahead and do credits here, and then that'll give anyone who wants to avoid spoilers the chance to duck out. Uh, this is Sunflower Sutras. Thank you to our patrons. Thank you, Katie.
Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Jen, for continuing to support us through all this. I know it's been a weird time. Our productivity has definitely suffered with the pandemic. And Tara and I both appreciate you all so much for sticking with us. And song full and farewell. And now for spoilers. So one of the big subjects in these stories is the inability to let go. And I mean, how that ties into necromancy is obvious. It's very, it's not subtle. You know, you have these characters who are literally digging up bones and reanimating them and, you know, using corpses like puppets. But something that I think is a little bit more subtle is the magic system behind the necromancy. So in this setting, there are two kinds of magical energy. There's thalergy and thanergy. Thalergy is life energy, and the necromancers can't really use that. Uh, it just kind of exists. But thalergy decays, much like radiation. It has a half-life. When it decays, it makes thanergy, which is death energy, which is what necromancers use to do necromancy. I think that decay really reflects how almost every character in this story has something that they're not willing to let go of and how self-destructive that can be. For example, in the second book, Harrow basically lobotomizes herself to avoid losing someone that she cares about. I mean, to an extent, she's running away from the pain of loss, but even then, that's still part of refusing to acknowledge that loss in the first place. You know, also in the second book, the... Emperor of the Nine Houses is being chased down by these cosmic horrors that were created by his own acts of necromancy and his own refusal to let people that he cares about die. There are also a number of characters who are, in one way or another, unable to die, which also ties into this. There's also a metafictional element to The Locked Tomb, they are very much stories about telling stories. Seriously, if I were still in college, I would be writing an essay about these books. For example, the the characters in both books are often framed as the cast of a play, especially in the second book when we go into Harrow's dream world where she's literally recruited the souls of the dead to basically create a fiction due to her... Once again, her ability to accept loss. Yeah, I mean, in the second book, Harrow is basically trying to, like, inject fan fiction of her own life into her brain. It's really bizarre and fascinating. This is also reflected in the magic system. Necromancers are so frequently constructing things, especially lictors, who can regrow their own limbs they have like almost like Deadpool level of regeneration. It's crazy. And the book goes into great detail describing like all the pieces, the the skeleton, the muscles, when necromancers construct things. Whether they're constructing some kind of skeleton or regrowing their own body parts. Whatever it is, there's always a lot of emphasis placed on the structure, like the physical structure of things. And this just plays in so well to how much of this story is essentially Harrow and the Emperor telling stories to themselves and constructing the world around them to fit their own desired narratives. So, little shallow, but that's about as deep as I can get into that now mainly because the third book is still forthcoming, so it's hard to say. I mean, there's really no way to say where these themes are going to go or how they're going to resolve, especially considering how unpredictable Tamsin Muir has proven to be already. But I just wanted to give a, a kind of a quick overview of some thematic things that I noticed just because I... Thought it was kind of neat, and I like how those themes are directly reflected in the magic system and the more fantastic elements of this fantasy story. And, uh, I already did credits. 
so I don't know how to end this.